at the Chapel of the Cross this morning. Welcome to those of you in the room. Welcome to those joining us online. Um, before I pass the proverbial mic this morning, I just wanted, I wanted to express gratitude uh, to those who are gathered, to those who have picked up a thread on which we started pulling back in 2018 and have continued the work and process of historical excavation and of storytelling. So thank you to Meg Flournoy and Noah Van Neal representing Vestry and staff who have helped to chair this process of our Racial Justice Executive Committee. And thank you to Allison Worthy and Harry Watson, Virginia Carson, David Dodson, Nancy Tunnison. Thanks to each of you for saying yes to the invitation and for accompanying us and inviting us into the journey of doing the work that is both looking inside and outside and that continuing process. So we are grateful. Thank you. Thank you, Mother Elizabeth Marie. Um, I'm going to offer a few words of introduction to frame both this week and next week. And then um, we're going to work our way through this timeline. And we've got really um, a wonderful group of folks who are here that would, um, we're going to sort of work through piece by piece. And they'll offer some commentary, some thoughts on different uh, eras of history in our common life. But I'd like to start with a prayer. And this collect comes from our prayer book. It's uh, one of the collects for social justice. This one uh, is original to the 1928 prayer book. It's number 21, found um, in the collects for various occasions. So let us pray. Almighty God, who created us in your own image, grant us grace fearlessly to, to, to contend against evil and to make no peace with oppression and that we may reverently use our freedom. Help us to employ it in the maintenance of justice in our communities and among the nations. To the glory of your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I want to start just by asking the, the question that may be on your minds or on someone's minds, is why are we doing this? Why are we doing this kind of work here? There are a couple sources we could point to, but I think one of the primary ones that I would like to start with comes from our baptismal covenant, in which we both as uh, the baptized and as the congregation supporting the baptized pledge to work for justice and peace among all people and respect the dignity of every human being. The baptismal covenant is our understanding of what it means to be a Christian. That's the Episcopal Church's uh, mission statement, if you will. And so to start there means that how could we not be doing this work? You also, though, could look at the Bible, not just the prayer book. And there are many places you could look for scriptural um, support for this work. But how about Luke that we heard just a couple weeks ago when Jesus comes to Nazareth where he had been brought up and he went into the synagogue as a young, young man, still a boy, and he stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was brought to him. And he looked through that scroll and found the place, it says. And he reads this, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And then he began to say to him, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. This is how Jesus understands his public mission and ministry. He selects these verses to read out and then says boldly, this is coming true now and here. He's quoting from Isaiah, Isaiah 61 and 58. In Isaiah 58, we will hear on Ash Wednesday, and it goes a little something like this to remind yourself. Is not this the fast that I choose 
to loose the bonds of injustice, to undo the thongs of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house when you see the naked to cover them and not to hide yourself from your own kin? If you remove the yoke from among you, the pointing of the finger, the speaking of evil, if you offer food to the hungry and satisfy the needs of the afflicted, then your light shall rise in the darkness and your gloom be like the noonday. Your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt. You shall raise up the foundations of many generations. You shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of the streets to live in. These verses, along with so many others, along with the baseline summary of the law, to love the Lord your God and to love your neighbor as yourself, this is why the church and our church is committed to the work of justice for the oppressed, the work of being a rebuilder, a repairer, a restorer of that which is broken. And in our understanding, race and the relationships between races in our country is one of the main things broken in our society. And the reason for that is over 400 years of chattel slavery, the legacy of which we are still living with today. That is why we at the Chapel of the Cross are committed to understanding the role that race specifically plays in our society and the way that we should, as Christians, engage with it. But to fix something, you first need to figure out what's broken. And part of that means acknowledging something is broken. And in order to acknowledge, you need to gain knowledge. So today is a first step. A step in sharing some knowledge about our history as a parish, written with a lens towards issues of race. So it's not a complete history, but in the stories we will tell and the dates we will lift up, it aspires to be a fuller history, if that makes sense. More nuanced, shaded, more complex. History helps us to understand who we are so that we might better understand our present moment and we felt it necessary to inform ourselves of our past before we set about charting a course into the future. So our history will be presented uh, up against other important dates in the nation, in our local community. And these timeline, this timeline we're presenting, we hope helps us to see patterns, to observe trends and note where we were ahead of the social norms, where we were behind, where we were in lockstep. We're not here to relitigate the past. We're here to inform and observe and then to discuss and to dream. This document that you have in your hands is meant to be built upon and to grow as more dates and data are learned. But we're excited to share our work this far, thus far. And so without further delay, I'd like to have our panel introduce themselves briefly And just note, you will have this handout in front of you, which we hope you will take home with you and read over closely. And then we will go through up on the slides a sort of um, uh, an annotated version of it. So, Meg, would you like to start? Just say hello. Hi, um, I'm Meg Flournoy. And um, as Elizabeth Marie mentioned, I'm a liaison from the vestry. And I have to say that since this group has been meeting, I have looked forward to every single time we have gathered together to be in the presence of such collective knowledge and history and to have dedicated time to dig into learning how much we learn from history and from seeing what our past is to understand now. So um, it's been a really grateful experience to be a part of that and I'll pass it over to Nancy. I'm Nancy Tennyson. Um, I am uh, a cradle Episcopalian. I've been a member of Chapel Cross for 26 years or so, and I am the descendant of an indentured servant, slave uh, owners, or people, or owners of enslaved people, I think is a better way to say that, and a participant of the Massachusetts uh, triangular slave trade. Uh, my name is David Dodson. Work You're good. You're held good. it like an ice cream cone, said Nancy earlier. 
Uh, my name is David Dodson, and I have been a member of this parish for now 35 years. I um, am a fourth generation Episcopalian. I am a descendant both of enslaved persons and of their enslavers, which um, has made this dive into history of our parish and of our community deeply meaningful and personally challenging. Thank you. I'm Virginia Carson. I've uh, that better? Yes. I'm Virginia Carson. I've been in the parish about 20 some years. Um, I come from Southern people all the way back 300 years. Um, so there's a whole lot I've discovered here as well. Thank you. Hi, I'm Harry Watson. I have been in Chapel Hill since 1976, teaching North Carolina history at the university. Uh, I was born in Greensboro, grew up there. Uh, I am, in addition to being a historian, I too am the descendant of enslavers. I'm Allison Worthy. And uh, I, we've been parishioners for 23 of the 27 years we've been in Chapel Hill. And uh, I am first and second generation Chinese American. Um, and my family has its own timeline. My father was the first Chinese student at Friends Seminary in New York City. And my mother was among the first Chinese students to attend Northwestern University in Evanston in 1947. I'm going to ask you to hold this for me, Allison. Just hold on until we're ready for that. So thank you. As you can tell, an, an estimable group of folks um, who have been helping steer us through. Um, and we are, again, very excited to share our work with you. So let's dive in. We have before you um, some early dates. This is sort of our section of time, which is ancient history into the pre-colonial days. And what we wanted to do was acknowledge the fact that um, race uh, did not begin uh, the, the relationships between um, the races in America did not begin in uh, the 1600s with slavery. It began all the way back with the first settlers, and we were able to trace back evidence of Native American tribes um, in this area dating all the way back to about 8,000, but then the cultural um, Native American tribes evidence has been found all the way back to 1,000 B.C. So that's a long time before uh, white people from Europe showed up, right? That's one of the things we wanted to do to highlight that. Then in the 1500s, we have Sir Walter Raleigh coming quickly by the early 1600s. Well, we have the, the Lost Colony. And then in the early 1600s, we get Jamestown. And really just 12 years after Jamestown is established, we've got the first slaves who are brought. This is happening um, you know, while things are still very much forming here in the colonies. And so you've got all the way until the 1660s before Carolina is really a thing. And then you've got some movement in the early 1700s where you're starting to see some establishment of uh, institutions and structure. You've got the Church of England establishing the first school. You've got um, the first parishes being established. Uh, and in, less, and in, in just over 100 years, from 1619 all the way to 1732, you've got 16.6% of the North Carolina population, about you know, one-sixth, uh, enslaved. You've got war with the native peoples. And then you also, at the same time, have the establishment of churches, parishes, in the sense of uh, uh, an, an uh, church building and the local geographic community around them. And that really is not the whole story, but some of the story in the ancient and colonial period up until the Revolutionary War. So just to note, native tribes long predate European settlers. Most of those tribes are driven out of the area of the Albemarle Sound from the eastern uh, part of the state by 1715. Slavery only 12 years after Jamestown and then by 1732 about 16% of the population enslaved. And note our denominational history as coming from the Church of England is tied closely to the history of this area. The British colonies meant British churches, right? and the way in which society was structured and ordered at that time was very much around churches. So 
That's our first chunk of time, and I'm going to turn over here, and Harry, I wonder if we might start with you, just to offer a comment or two upon that time that will help elucidate it for uh, us. Yeah. Sure, thank you very much. I, I've got very little to add, except to, to note that uh, forced labor was sort of baked into Europeans' idea of what colonialism was going to be all about, uh, starting with the Spanish and the Portuguese, and including uh, the English and the French and uh, Dutch and so on, uh, so that um, the Lord's proprietors were not in, um, not uh, out of line with that tradition when they wrote a fundamental constitution saying that uh, masters will have full authority of all their, over all their slaves of what opinion or religion soever is the quotation, meaning that uh, becoming a Christian would not mean becoming free. And that was, uh, of course, a, an ironclad rule all the way down. Others want to comment on that? David, do you, did you want to say? Okay. No one else on this early history here. I know this is Harry's specialty. <laughs> yeah, it is. This is his territory. Um, I want you to admire my brethren. That's right. <laughs> that's good. Well, we're going to have plenty more to dig in on because then we get the American Revolution. Allison, next slide there. Yeah, 1775, right, to 1783. And this has a, a large impact upon the colonies and on the churches at the same time. What's interesting to note is you go through the revolution, everything gets revolutionized, and you come out the other side, and being a part of the Church of England was uh, not necessarily a good thing anymore, right? And different states went about this differently, but in North Carolina, it was uh, it pretty much decimated those Anglican churches in the area, and it took a while, as you'll see in a moment, for them to sort of get their feet back. Virginia was a slightly different story, so it really had to do with how people decided they wanted to approach being English after, uh, after the Revolution. One thing I think it's really important to note, and one of the reasons that this timeline is not just focused on the Chapel of the Cross, is that as you're looking at those years after the Revolution, you're looking at the, the foundation of America, really, the establishment of our founding documents. You're looking at the, the reformation and establishment of the United States Protestant Episcopal Church, so our church. And you're looking at UNC being founded, all within pretty much the same time, which I think is somewhat interesting to note. Also to note is post-revolution, about 1790, we're up to about 25% of the entire North Carolina population enslaved, one out of every four people. Orange County is a little lower than that, about 17%. But we're still, uh, Orange County at this point, still relatively small. And if you remember, you're coming from the water, so things moved both over time and geography from east to west. So the predominant uh, areas of uh, population were on the eastern side of the state. You see on this timeline also the Episcopal Diocese is getting approved a few years after the Episcopal Church in general is, um, is established, but it takes all the way in from 1794 to 1817 for the diocese to really be established. They had uh, a bishop, and he wasn't even consecrated, John Stark Ravenscroft, and I think this really speaks to the, um, the muddle that was the Anglican Church in the early decades, not just early years, but early decades after the Revolution. As you move along, though, things do become a little more established. And you've got uh, the church establishing itself, and then you've got um, the university sort of building in prominence. And at a certain point, um, William Mercer Green, who is our founding priest, um, goes about founding a church here in this location, a chapel, um, that is built uh, beginning in 1842 and built by his slaves. He was a slave owner, and we've talked about that in the past. It takes them about six years, so it isn't until 1848 that the chapel is consecrated. And in that time, in those early decades from the 1840s until the Civil War and even beyond, there's, um, it's really a small church with just a, a handful, maybe a dozen families who make it up. And we're going to focus a little more on that next week, about who those people were and who was in their households. But you're looking at... Um, in some ways, and Allison, you can go to the next slide. Yeah, you're right there. Um, in some ways, in many ways, if you look at percentage of our population, these early decades, pre-emancipation, were our most racially diverse as a parish, which raises some interesting questions, I think, for us to think about. 
So here are just a few notes here. Um, Episcopal Church, UNC, USA, all being founded around the same time. The revolution's impact on the church and taking it a, a while for it to reestablish itself. And then eventually when it does, the founding of our parish with William Mercer Green and those few families, which again will be our specific focus. We're going to dive in there. But this period from revolution to civil war, I might uh, open it up to the group and see if anybody has something they wanted to add. Virginia? Go ahead. Hold on. Let's get you the microphone. When I went back to look at this period, what was striking to me is how intense and difficult the debate over slavery was from the very beginning. Um, for the framers of the Constitution, including the North Carolina framer, Hugh Williamson, um, painful and long and hard debates. It, it wasn't, as I look back on this history, it's not nearly the simplified version we all got in school. It, it is much more complex. There, there are much more um, nuance and individualism in, in this and a, a difficult, painful, long debate over both the slave trade, which was hugely profitable in all the colonies, and the moral basis of slavery itself. And we all know we were never able to resolve that uh, until a bloody civil war um, some 80 years later. Yeah, thank you. David, go ahead. Um, and I also was struck, um, and Harry alluded to this, by the, uh, the paradox or the contradiction that one could be baptized and still enslaved and also baptized and still an enslaver. Mm -hmm. And that this was, this contradiction, this paradox was part and parcel of the society. And it seems really quite incredible to us. And we found an example, I think, of a catechism designed to be uh, delivered verbally to enslaved people because enslaved people were not allowed to be taught to read. So there was the idea of communicating the content of the faith without equipping people with the currency of their own liberation, yeah, which that's is nice ex extremely um, perplexing and challenging to wrestle with. Harry, I wonder if you might, I'm going to say one thing and then we'll come back to you, Nancy, but Harry, I wonder if you might say a little bit about what we understand or what we think we know about um, Christian enslavers' understanding of what it is they're doing when they're baptizing. As you, if you note, 1854, the baptism of Cornelia Smith, who has a, a slide, of, you know, a, a panel over there on the wall, um, a, a, a forerunner of, of Pauli Murray, baptized here and becoming a, a communicant but still enslaved. And then also you get Susan Holden, a, a woman of color who is free, also confirmed here, participating in the life of the community, it is more complicated. So Harry, well, go it's, ahead. It's very complicated. Uh, we know that throughout Europe, but certainly in England, um, uh, converting the heathen to Christianity was supposed to be part of the mission of colonialism, and that included uh, converting the Africans uh, and, as well as the Indians. And it meant that capturing Africans and putting them in the hold of a ship and bringing them over to North Carolina was part of the civilizing, Christianizing mission. That was what, uh, that was what people thought they were doing. It is also true that once here, the Christianization, quote unquote, of the, of the Africans was neglected, uh, especially by the Anglican church. Uh, some of the evangelical churches were more uh, enthusiastic about it. And uh, it, it, that whole process moved very slowly, uh, but uh, eventually it, it, uh, it did pick up. And the enslaved, well, uh, as a slaveholding society, North Carolina and the other uh, slaveholding states were challenged by opponents of slavery saying, how can you abide this? this uh, unchristian institution. And they pointed straight to the New Testament and the Old Testament uh, for examples of uh, slavery in that society as well and said, see, if it wasn't a sin for St. Paul, it can't be a sin for us. And uh, that um, 
kind of literalistic reading of the uh, of the scriptures became a hallmark of these southern and slave supporting churches uh, and that means it's kind of uh, a special burden on us as well thank you nancy did you want to? no you're all set anyone else want to comment on that You're ready for the next one. All right, Nancy's ready for the next one. So let's move on to the next one. We don't want to keep Nancy waiting. Um, all right, so we're up to the Civil War, right? Um, we're not going to do too much talking about the Civil War. I hope you've learned about it. Um, I found, what, sorry? You're Okay, I hope you've learned about it. Maybe you didn't learn about it by that name, but maybe you learned about it all the same. I think one of the, so the Civil War happens. It's, it's obviously immensely disruptive. It immensely sort of takes over um, the sort of the, the spirit of the, of the entire country, particularly in the South. But what we really want to focus on in this next section is on that period post-Civil War called Reconstruction, let's say, and the way in which Reconstruction was uh, felt here in Chapel Hill, at Chapel of the Cross, and then the establishment of Jim Crow laws, which comes, you know, not quite a generation later, which uh, seeks to sort of uh, regain some ground that maybe may have been lost by those who are no longer legally allowed to own human beings. So you've got, um, within the Civil, War, the Civil War itself, the Diocese of North Carolina does join the Confederate States of America, the Episcopal Church in the Confederate States of America. You also then, after, well, let me actually go back one second. In 1860, we, we sort of max out at about 33% of the North Carolina population as enslaved. So that's one out of every three people. That's a lot of people by that point. Um, then, as you move out of, the civil, out of the Civil War, the numbers are pretty much the same, but you don't quite call them the same. So if you look at 1870 here, you're looking at about 63% and then 36%, 37% white and then colored or people of color, so blacks mostly. Notable that uh, Indian, Native American, virtually non-existent across the state. Uh, and in some places, very, very, very small. And, you know, if you go all the way back to the beginning of our timeline, they were here first, let's remember. So what you see uh, in Chapel Hill, in the Chapel of the Cross, is post-Civil War, the town of Chapel Hill is pretty much shut down. The university is closed. The parish pretty much closes for all functional purposes. And it's only because of some donations from people like um, Mary Ruffin Smith, who restores the roof of the chapel, which was sort of falling in, it, it fell on very hard times. And again, these are some interesting things we're learning more and more about these families. So UNC is closed, Chapel of the Cross is closed. Uh, again, mostly, uh, there are a few families holding the line, which I think was important for us to point out that as a church, we started in the 1840s. We almost closed in the 1860s and 70s. We were not what we understand ourselves to be as a parish for, for generations. Not just a few years, not just a few decades, but you know, maybe about 60 years or so, all the way up until about 1900. So we, we start to see, as, as the South gets its foot, feet back under it, uh, and as the parish and the town get the feet, their feet back under them in the 1880s, there's this reestablishment of society and say, okay, well, how are we going to live and how are we going to work? And that's when you start to get these Jim Crow laws that are trying to create separate but equal, I'll put in square quotes, for how we should live. So you get separate churches for people of color. You get separate places to do pretty much everything. And that becomes the law of the land for, again, a whole other generation. And you see that uh, borne out in the establishment of St. Titus in Durham in the 1880s as a church, specific, a mission and then a church specifically for the black residents of Durham. You see that in um, Henry B. Delaney, uh, elected finally, but sort of functioning as the bishop to the African-American churches, right, in the early 1900s. And you also see uh, examples of, um, of white society trying to limit the freedoms of black society and things like Plessy and Ferguson, Wilmington Massacre, and then this uh, North Carolina legislature's poll tax and literacy test for voting, making voting very, very difficult for those who, as David said, were never taught to read uh, and never given those tools. So next slide there, Allison. With the closing of the town and the university and pretty much the parish, Jim Crow laws expanding across the South through the 1880s and beyond, 
and then separate but equal becoming the way of life, not just the law, but the way of life there. I wonder if we might have some words about that. Nancy, you want to get us started? <laughs> no. Um, I think in, in doing the reading and thinking about this, one of the things that really struck me as somebody who did not grow up in the South where the impact of the Civil War physically changed the landscape and relation. Um, I was very struck by what chaos uh, existed here in this area. The university was the economy of the town. The, this church had been founded, yes, by a few families, but the students had compulsory chapel, and at that point, the compulsory chapel was Presbyterian. So the part of our purpose in starting was to offer what few Anglican uh, remnants there were, a place to worship that wasn't a Presbyterian church. And so when the, when the university closed, we lost a significant number and percentage of our congregation. Uh, and you're back to just a few struggling families who in the economy are having a hard time. And they met occasionally. They met on Sundays for morning prayer. They couldn't afford a priest. They didn't barely had enough folks for a vestry. Once a month, a guy, the priest from Pittsburgh, which was still a thriving church, would ride up here and administer communion. That, that was pretty startling. I, I, that, that was something that really told me that this parish was not much of a parish at, at this point in time. And the few African-American members of the parish uh, prior to the war did not stay uh, afterwards. They left this parish and were part of that movement to start other churches. Uh, it was a really hard time, and we became, in fact, later in this period, the recipient of missionary work. People came down from the north to help this poor church keep our building afloat. And I just want to emphasize what a pathetic mess we were. <laughs> at this Thank point. you, Nancy. <laughs> Thank you for emphasizing. And, no, but and then I want to add that the power struggles that were going on in this community were only what you can imagine. The, it, the change of power and who had it uh, did not go easily. Yeah, thank you. David. And just to, uh, to pick up on that, this is such a fascinating period. And the push and pull between forces of what one might call, um, after the fact, liberation and freedom and retrenchment are just palpable everywhere. And just to look at 1867 when St. Augs is founded and the yeah. very next year this university closes, there you have, I mean, that, that to me is just fascinating, just the, the, it's not give and take, it really is push and pull, um, and how much the society is in transition. Mm -hmm. You have the terrible um, revolution or anti-revolution in Wilmington, and then less than 20 years later, this diocese um, consecrates the first African-American suffragan bishop. So you see movements for and against, um, one might call progress, um, but that even can be debated. But I think the question then that Noah asked us at the beginning as we read this is um, when are we standing as a parish and a diocese with the dominant forces? When are we pushing against them? And which dominant forces are we standing for and against? And that is, I think, a fascinating question we haven't yet answered, but is worthy really of inquiry. When times are shifting, where did we put a stake in the ground, um, articulate our vision, and, um, and live out our faith? Thank you. 
Um, just a 30 second comment. There is in this period also a whole nother history we don't know anything about. And that is the freed people establishing their own communities, um, building a whole culture, uh, things, a, a culture of liberation and, and abundance and resilience in many ways. Most of it oral history. Mm. Um, be, because we don't have a lot of records, and if there were, they weren't shared with us. Mm. So there's this whole shadow or parallel community as well um, uh, from that 30% of, of folks um, who, who are now liberated and building their own lives, and no wonder they don't want to be with us. Would you? <laughs> Yeah. I, I didn't think I was going to say anything about this, but I, I can't resist. We've all driven past St. Paul AME a million times, do it every day. Uh, next time you go, uh, you do that, uh, look at their sign. It says, founded 1864. That's a year before emancipation in this county. That's a year before union occupation. That's when assembling in a church service, an all-black church service, was illegal without a white supervisor. It was illegal for a black person to stand up and preach the gospel in a, in a congregation. Uh, so I want to know more about that, but that's the time when our sister congregation, St. Uh, Paul, uh, came out of uh, the shadows, if you will, and um, made itself uh, into a, a permanent ongoing entity. And that is uh, an example of the kind of thing that Virginia was talking about. Yes, there is. It may this have involved some of our parishioners too. Yeah. There is this, this push and pull, this complex uh, interchange between races and peoples. And I think that's part of what we're trying to lift up and highlight and then zoom in on and learn from how that was, and, and again, to David's point, where we stood in relationship to it. Because as we move into the 20th century, um, you do see some places where we do stand up, and maybe places that, um, that were not, uh, that, are, that are more sort of ahead of where the culture is at that point, um, which I think we should also note. Up until this point, it's unclear whether you know, the church was willing to take much of a stand on slavery, and in many ways seemed to be uh, of the times. But we start to generate some momentum as a parish around the turn of the century. And there is this, um, we have a, a, a rector who comes and spends only three years here. His name is uh, Marshall, Reverend Marshall, Maynard Marshall, 1917 to 1920. And as the parish is thinking about building a new church, the big church, which eventually gets completed in 1925, um, they're asking this guy after just three years to go. It's, they write a sort of general letter, a very clear, strong letter of dismissal, but we then know that Reverend Marshall goes back to South Carolina and becomes the head of, in his area, of the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, and I wonder, and I think there's some justification for this wondering, whether there was something about his racial views that was not in keeping with the parish at that time. Because soon after him, you've got uh, Reverend Lawrence who comes, and then the church is getting built and the, the congregation is growing. Things were, um, it seems strange to get rid of a rector so forcibly after just three years if there wasn't some, weren't some irreconcilable differences. They do note his ministry to the students was not up to snuff, but it may have been more than that. So um, you also then get, I mean, you get World War II, which is uh, disruptive on a global scale, but then you get David Gates being called as rector right on the heels of World War II, and he is a noted pacifist. Now, we're not here to litigate pacifism versus, um, versus you know, warmongering or anything like that. But I do think it's interesting to note that he was not only, uh, let's say, uh, firm in his convictions about war, he was also firmly committed to integrating the parish, or let's say reintegrating the parish in the 1950s. So he does that because in 1951, there's the first African-American student at UNC School of Law and med school. Um, I believe that um, one of them in 1951 or 1952 was, uh, was it Oscar Diggs and his family were uh, members of the church, sort of, and David Yates tried to, to pull them in and make them feel welcome. We have folks in our parish today, I talked to one this morning, who knew them and were here for that time. So we're starting to get into our lived history as a parish. I'm looking at Carol and Jamie. I'm not going to put you in the 1950s here, but I will say you grew up in this church. 
right? And so you have, we're getting into your time here as well. You're also starting to see in the general society some movement in motion on these things. You've got the Freedom Rides coming in the late 1940s through Chapel Hill. You've got in 1952, general convention of the entire Episcopal Church uh, adopting a resolution against racial discrimination. And then you've got in 54, Brown versus the Board of Education. And that's this real turning point within the society. So if you go to that, there you go. So I've hit on all these. Uh, for time's sake, I'm going to push us forward for the second half of the 20th century and then open it up for some comments. Because then as you move through the 50s and into the 60s, note how um, the parish sort of picks up that uh, mantle of equality. And with Thomas Thrasher, who was um, basically forced out or removed from his previous parish in Alabama for having participated in the Montgomery bus boycott as one of the one white priests or ministers to do that. He comes here and is welcomed with open arms. He has some health troubles, so his tenure is not as long and illustrious as it might otherwise have been. But um, you're starting to see in the late 50s and into the 60s, this parish really getting around things. We've got the uh, North Carolina Fund established in 1963. And the leader of that was George Esser. George Esser was a member of this community. Uh, he and his wife, Mary. Mary, yes. And so they both were central to not only the Chapel of the Cross, but also this big initiative to eliminate poverty across North Carolina and the South. So you've got all these movements. You've got the, the Episcopal Diocese of North Carolina contributing a, a sizable sum of money in 1969 to the foundation of Malcolm X Liberation University, which was, uh, ended up a somewhat failed experiment, but at the time was uh, a very uh, progressive um, institution to be founding and establishing. In, 19, in 1970, you get the first African-American Episcopal bishop, not Bishop Suffragan for the colored churches, but actual bishop of the Episcopal Church. That's in Massachusetts with John Burgess. You've got Pauli Murray uh, in 1977 celebrating. And were any of you here or around at that time that you were sort of noted that? Yes, I'm seeing some hands coming up in the room. So uh, we are, again, living this history. And then you've got in the 80s a, a, an establishment of a relationship between Chapel of the Cross and St. Paul AME. And then you've got Michael Curry. You've got the first female rector in 2016. We could go through our history and look at uh, gender through a lens, and I think we would uh, have as much to learn from and act on from that as we did, but we're looking at race predominantly. And then you've got 2018, Silent Sam coming down. And if you turn all the way to the last slide, that's where we stand, right? 2020, this is the census. In North Carolina and in Orange County, You've got a diversity of races of significant percentages. And I think one of the, the, the hopes of this committee and this group is to say, okay, let's figure out how we got to where we are. Let's look clearly at where we are, and then let's dream about how we move, where we want to be. What kind of beloved community do we want to be? And here are the people that are in our community. And do we reflect what that community looks like? Are we engaged in work to uh, the benefit of all? the different colors and creeds that exist across North Carolina right now. That is the operational question moving forward as for our whole parish. So that's the 20th century. Did any of you guys want to make a comment or two on that uh, as, we, as we wrap up in just a few minutes? Yeah, Nancy, and then, yeah, sure. I do want to comment on the building of the new church uh, in the 20s. We didn't really initiate that. And I think we should remember that. There was a man named Irwin, like Sam Irwin of Watergate time, <laughs> Irwin Road, um, who was really convinced that the Episcopal churches near major learning centers should have a lovely church and a big enough church. And he was the one who gave us the money to build our sanctuary with the proviso that we had to upgrade, I believe, the parish hall a little bit and do a few little things on our own. But we did not raise that money. We did not really build that church in the sense. Um, and, but it pushed us into a whole new phase, I think, of our ministry. That's right. And William Irwin had his own uh, history and where his family got the money that then was used to build that as a strong, prominent Southern family. Yes. 
Allison, yeah. I also think it's worth noting that um, in the 20, 20th century, uh, 21st century, the Chapel of the Cross was a founding member of the IFC. In yeah. 1963, uh, a group of seven women in Chapel Hill who were members of Church Women United got together to address issues of poverty. And one of those members, we are told, uh, was a member of Chapel of the Cross. And we still, that relationship exists today. Another really important date was 1977 when Pauli Murray celebrated her first Eucharist at the Chapel of the Cross. And um, today we have a small group called the Daughters of the King who have chosen Pauli Murray as the founding member of our chapter because she spoke to her, her accomplishments and her persona and her being really spoke to all of us. Um, and the funny thing about Pauli Murray today, especially in this time, is that in 1971, she wrote a letter to President Nixon proposing herself as a nominee for the Supreme Court um, of the seat that was being vacated by Hugo Black. And so that was, a, a, it, a, she was really ahead of her time. And um, so that she's a very important person to us in this parish. Yes, I think that's right, Allison. I, I know that's right. Well, I wonder if we, so that, that brings us to um, the end of our formal presentation, but that really is, uh, it's meant to be the beginning of the conversation. And so what we're hoping for is that you come back next week or tune in again next week when Mark will be giving a presentation that focuses in on some of the people from these periods, especially the sort of early periods, early decades of our church, and helps lend a, a sort of more personal uh, appearance or uh, information to what is, you know, relatively um, clear factual date information on things. So that's our hope for next week. Following that, we're going to be establishing a series of conversations that we hope many of you will participate in. Some will be in person, some will be on Zoom, and we'll, get, uh, we'll be circulating dates and sign-ups for that. But these will be small group facilitated conversations that allow us to react, to respond, to add in information that we may have missed, to reflect on what it means to be a part of a community where this is our history, uh, and then start to dream together about, given this, where do we want to go? And so that's what we're hoping to be able to do coming from these presentations. So please don't think of this as sort of being all finished and ready to uh, be sent off. So we are still very much in conversation about this. Also, uh, we'll have two, three minutes, maybe four, uh, for some responses right now from you all. And then there's also going to be emailed out on Monday. And if you'd like, you can email me. Uh, a Google form if you don't feel comfortable articulating your thoughts in person here verbally. If you wanted to write them down and send them, that will also help us as we, now, as we try to uh, digest this information together. So are there any questions or thoughts? If you shout out a, a, a response, I can repeat it into the mic so people at home can have it. And then if we need a response here, again, two, three, maybe four minutes before we get ready for church. Barbara, yeah. From, um, sorry, so where it currently stands at 10%, which is interesting if you note, equal to the Hispanic population now, to from what, from the 60s? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, to 10%. Does anybody want to talk about, do we have any knowledge of why that might be? Interesting to note. White, okay, so Harry, why don't you say that, and then Virginia has a comment. My guess would be it's, it's white in migration changes the percentages. And my guess is it's black out migration. <laughs> um, I, it is expensive to live here. Um, it's, it's, there is a vibrant community next door in Durham. Um, I, I think for a lot of black families, it was a better situation, not here in, in Chapel Hill in Orange County. Good, thank you. Thanks for that question, Barbara. Other questions or comments on this information? Jamie, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so Tom Thrasher's influence 
in, I mean, he was not here as long as David Yates and, you know, Peter Lee came after him, but for those 10 years, a really strong, impactful influence in this community. Thank you, Jamie. Yeah, for, for the younger people as well. Growing up into that, let's say, more progressive, more um, uh, aware understanding of the races and interactions. Yeah. Harriet. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Harry. Yeah, locate our place in history. I'll just say that out for the f benefit of the folks at home. I think that's right. I think that's very much what, why we're going about this work in the way that we're doing it. Um, so that we can locate ourselves in this story and then take the initiative and the agency to help write the next chapter of it, which is right. Yeah, Teddy? Um, can you say that that was the people who the history of our current I think we certainly can, yes. And Teddy's saying, can we say that separate but equal continues into our current day? Well, yeah. Separate but, separate but unequal, maybe, maybe the. Uh, we agree on separate, okay. Yeah, Teddy, go ahead, finish your comment. I interrupted. Is that realistic? I don't know, but I think it's worth knowing, as uh, Teddy's asking about, is it realistic to think that our church population would mirror the, the demographics of the community? I think it, it, it may not be that our Sunday mornings look like that, but it may be that uh, the way in which our church connects with the community um, allows for that fact, and the people that we're working with and the relationships that we form are not just with that 60%, but with that other 40% in various ways. So I think you're right. I think you're... Um, I don't think necessarily, and I don't think necessarily it's the right way to go about it, saying, well, if we just had many more black members in our parish, we would, be, uh, we would have overcome racism and we would be all set. Right? I think that there's, that's a false, uh, false equivalence there. Yeah. Barb, I'm going to give you the last word, and then we're going we're gonna to get ready for church. Yeah. Memory. Yes. We have to allow for other people's memory, and we have to inform our own memory with perhaps a, um, an accurate and true uh, understanding of what the past was. Right. Yes. I think that's right. And I think there's still more history to be written. And that will be our task as we carry it forward. I want to thank our panel. I want to thank you guys all for being here. And we will see you next week. If you want to hang around for questions, I know people can, can say hello. I need to run off and get ready. But thank you guys for being here. And uh, we'll, we'll see you next week. Thank you.